Greetings from Dr. Peter McLuhan, your host for another adventure in the life Jesus modeled. Our topic today is cast out demons. Last week, we began the first of two episodes on how to cast out demons. As I travel around the world, I have observed that most ministers try to deliver people from spirits by shouting at them to say, come out in the name of Jesus. Many try to get demonized people to say, Jesus is Lord. These are religious practices that have become popular, but not necessarily effective. Demons are not deaf, and they have no problem saying that Jesus is Lord. There are better ways to cast out evil spirits. Jesus did not model shouting or asking people to say, I am the Lord or Jesus is Messiah. That was not his approach. Note with me that Jesus did not look for demons, but demons looked for Jesus. I don't look for demons either, but they look for me. Spirits are drawn to the power that followers of Jesus carry. Last week, we looked at three ways to move more effectively in the ministry of deliverance. The first is to know the difference between power and authority. When we move in power, we heal diseases. But when we move in authority, we cast out spirits. Jesus called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Luke chapter 10 and verse 19 says, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Evil spirits leave when they recognize the authority you have over them. There is no need to shout at demons. They are net, not deaf. And when you speak to spirits with authority, they must obey you. <clears throat> the Apostle John said, The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. We never need to ask God if it is his will to evict spirits from people. Second, it is important to understand God's order of created beings. When we do, then we realize why we have authority over demons and why demons seek to possess humans. In Psalm 8, we read that the divine order of creation is God, man, angels, whether good or bad, animals. Spirits occupy humans to manifest the rebellion against God and take over the power that we have been given from him. Uh, this brought us to the third question about deliverance, and that is, can believers have evil spirits? Believers and non-believers can both be demonized. Listen to what Paul said to the believers in Ephesus. Do not give the devil an opportunity, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27 the Greek word for opportunity is topos. It refers to a place or an occasion or a location. It is the root Greek word for the English word topography, as in topographical maps. Paul said that to the believers in Ephesus, do not give the devil real estate or a place to occupy in your life. The writer to the Hebrews gives a warning to followers of Jesus, take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12, this verse clearly says that believers can have evil in their hearts. That evil is not the Spirit of God, it is another spirit. Last week I shared a story about a lady who had a spirit of fear. And when I commanded fear to leave her, she felt a bolt-like object flying out of the back of her neck, and it has not returned. Please listen to part one of Cast Out Demons to hear her story again. Now, not all deliverance is as easy as that one. Uh, some spirits are so 
deeply embedded that a battle plan is needed to cast them out. And here are some more ways both believers and non-believers can be demonized and how to deal with them. People can be demonized through traumatic experiences, both physical and emotional, uh, through willfully sinning, through generational sin, through occult practices, through harboring bitter feelings and vowing to take revenge on someone. This brings me to the fourth aspect of deliverance that I want to speak about on this important subject. Before any army goes into battle, rules of engagement are established. Uh, it is a better way to evict embedded spirits. Ask persons seeking the help the following questions. Do I have permission to speak to any spirits that are demonizing you? Do you give permission to any spirits in you to speak to me? Are you aware of any curses that have been spoken over you, like you are never wanted or you'll never amount to anything? Uh, people suffer terrible curses at the hands of parents, both mothers and fathers, and sometimes uncles and aunties. If you've had a curse said over you, we want to break that curse in the name of Jesus. Breaking these curses and send them back to the person who spoke them as a blessing uh, rather than a curse is a powerful way to begin to get set free. Uh, say to the spirits, I command all the spirits that have a legal right to be present to be present. Pastor Margaret and I were ministering to a young man, and he said to me, my demons leave me when I come and see you, but they are waiting for me on the doorstep as soon as I return to my home. We commanded those spirits to be present, and we were able to deal with them. So forbid any hiding. I command you to tell the truth before God. Uh, cut off uh, any outside help. Demons will try to rescue one another uh, from uh, being uh, cast out. Forbid any violence, any injury to the person that you are seeking to set free and any injury to you. Forbid any throwing up. Uh, if you're working with a team, no shouting. And no repeating in Jesus' name. Talk like you are a judge. Always stay in control in the situation. This brings me to the fifth aspect of deliverance that I'd like to talk about. After you have prayed for protection and established rules of engagement, what do you do next to begin a deliverance session? It is very seldom that people are able to tell you what demons are bothering them. Uh, here is one way to begin a conversation. Ask a person to share their story. What brought them to you in the first place? What made them interested in possibly seeking deliverance? Take notes while you are listening to the persons sharing their story. <clears throat> Ask Holy Spirit to alert you uh, to any spirits that you might think are present in that person as you are ministering to them. As you Listen, look for hurtful experiences that may have given spirits a foothold. Things like accidents or bitterness, hurtful experiences, abuse, addiction, doctor-prescribed medications, especially painkillers. Addictions often begin with taking pain medications like opioids. These are some good questions to ask spirits and see what they say. How did you get in? You can actually ask a spirit that. Sometimes they're dumb enough to tell you. Who else is working with you? Who is the head demon? What does this person have to do to break your power over them? You'd be amazed at how many answers you get to these questions. They're very useful in helping people get free. Here's a very important question. Are you a generational spirit? Are you on your mother's side or on your father's side? We can explore those lines and see what openings were created. After we identify spirits, what do we do next? The sixth aspect of deliverance is breaking the power of spirits so that they can be expelled. We often use a scale of 1 to 10 to assess how much power spirits have over a person. Ask the spirit, how much power do you have uh, over this person? And after you have a starting point, you can begin to break down the power 
of that spirit. Let's suppose a person you're talking with has a spirit of shame. Say, by the cross of Christ, the empty tomb, and the risen Lord, spirit of shame, I break your power over the person and name the person that you are ministering to. Uh, ask the person, is the spirit of shame's power over you been broken? Uh, people have a profound sense of what's going on inside of them. They're able to say, yes, there's a change. I feel the power. I feel freedom coming. So if yes, ask how much power still remains. It's all very subjective, but this is what doctors do every day to assess pain in people's lives. It works equally well in deliverance. If a person gets stuck breaking power, it might be necessary to minister to an emotional wound. Uh, so take time to minister to that wound and uh, try to help people find a way to forgive someone who has hurt them. And then go back and break the Spirit's power again. You'll be amazed at how much just releasing people and saying, I forgive you from the heart breaks the power of strongholds on a person's life. By the cross of Christ, the empty tomb, the risen Lord, spirit of shame, I break your power. After the spirit's power has been broken, then it's time to expel that spirit. I like to have demonized people expel their own spirits. Teaching a person to expel their own spirits helps them keep their spiritual house clean. They know what it's like to have a demon leave, and so they become in tune to what it's like to have a demon attempt to come inside them. The spirit, name the spirit whose power has been broken. I'll just say with a person, if it's shame again, I just say, spirit of shame, I call your to, to attention. Have the person tell the spirit of shame to go. Ask the person if they felt that spirit leave. Now invite Holy Spirit to come and fill the place that that spirit left. <clears throat> Working with uh, an apostle in Africa in a region where there was a great stronghold against the enemy. And as he went down into that region, we were texting together very closely. He said, Papa, my hotel room is completely demonized. Things were being thrown around. Noises were going on. And we began to break. Something very evil must have happened in that hotel room the night before the apostle arrived there. We broke the power over that room. We cleansed the room, and he had a deep and good sleep. Went to the tent revival the next morning. And the Spirit of God fell upon that place. And uh, as preaching was going on, the tent pegs began to shake, and the tent began to shake. Even though there was no wind, it was the wind of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we read about this in the New Testament, that the place shook where the Holy Spirit fell upon the people. Uh, as they prayed for those who came forward, fetishes fell off of young people. Uh, these knots that are tied on children at a very young age that can't be untied, they just fell to the ground with the knots completely tied, and when the person stepped aside, the fetish had come off of them. Uh, some of the witch doctors' children came to know Jesus. They too were set free. And they invited uh, uh, the apostle to, to visit their home. And, but before the apostle could get there, the witch doctor had fled. And uh, there was great terror amongst the people. And we continued to pray for the power of God to fall upon that man. We commanded his spirits to drive him to the meeting uh, that following night. And he came the next meeting. That witch doctor came. He confessed his sins. He said, your power is greater than my power. And that's why he had fled, because he was afraid of the anointing that the apostle was carrying. And so the doctor made his, witch doctor made his own decision to burn his compound to the ground, his bones and skulls and all his magic stuff. He burned it. He said, your God is more powerful than mine. What a great story this is. Hundreds of people have been set free. And whatever spirits are haunting you, you can be set free from them. And as you minister in the power of the Holy Spirit, you can set people free uh, from the spirits that inhabit people. Next week, we'll continue studying the life Jesus modeled. Let me take a few moments and pray with you. Maybe this message has scared you. I break spirit of fear now that people will hear truth that will set them free so the Holy Spirit can come in and flood in your lives. So we come against these three 
spirits that run together, fear, shame, and control. I break shame off of your life right now. Spirit of shame, I break your power in Jesus' name. Spirit of fear, I break your power in Jesus' name. Spirit of control, I break your power over persons listening to this message who need to hear this tonight. You have some rejection that has gone on in your life. We minister healing to you. Though mother and father reject you, yet the Lord will take you up. The Lord will never reject you. Whosoever will to the Lord may come. He will never in any ways cast anyone out. We break off of you all rejection that has happened in your life. Any abandonment that's happened in your life, we, we just surround you with the arms of the Jesus and the Holy Spirit to minister to you and to comfort to you and say that you are important to Jesus. He loves you and cares about you very much. Maybe you see yourself as a failure. Uh, that's all people have ever said to you. You're just never going to be anything. But Jesus sees more in you than you could possibly see in yourself at this moment. And we break off a spirit of failure that may have come upon you. We fill you with hearing the loving voice of a heavenly Father. And so I open your ears to hear the voice of the Father. The voice of the Father is always loving. And he will always encourage you and always give you another opportunity. But competing for that voice is your own voice. The voice that says you should or you ought or you wish. That's your own voice. We want to shut that voice down so you hear the voice of the Father. Then, of course, there's the voice of the demonic world. You can't. You're no good. You'll never. God will never accept you. That's not the voice of the Father. That's the voice of an evil spirit. We shut those voices down and open you to hear the voice of the Father lovingly speaking to you. Whatever you've done, whatever circumstance you've been, whatever mess you've made of your life, there's hope for you that God would lift you up from those circumstances, fill you with the power of his Holy Spirit, and give you hope to keep moving forward. Next week, we'll continue to study the life Jesus modeled. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk with someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as $1 a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International, Incorporated. All donations to Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.